And welcome to We Are The People Radio. This is your host, Jason Preston. And again, with my beautiful bride. Some days. <laughs> Most days. Most every day. <laughs> let's face it. Except for when you're pissed off. <laughs> Anyways, it's good to be here. Um, and today, we, we have a show today that is the third of a, of a series we are doing. Um, that will piss you off. <laughs> that will, yes, yes. Uh, on the shadows of darkness. Shadows, shadows of power. Of power. There we go. There and is shadows of darkness as well now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we've got someone who uh, has, we've had uh, our eye on bringing in here for a while. Someone who is very close to many of the victims, uh, who has talked to countless, and we're going to have her share a little bit. But uh, before we jump into this, uh, please make sure you're following us. Obviously, you know by now our, our YouTube has been hacked, our Twitter's been hacked, so please follow us on Rumble or go to our website, weirdthepeople.org and uh, sign up for our newsletter. We're going to start sending that out as well. And then please, uh, if, especially with the cyber attack, we've have to, you know, it, this does cost money to protect ourselves and, and to put on the show. So please, you can help by supporting our, our sponsors or by supporting us yourself. But I want to thank gcoptimize.com. Uh, if you are a, a general contractor and you're needing leads, uh, check out gcoptimize.com. That's what they do is help general contractors getting leads. And they're, they're honestly, they're amazing. They obviously are helping us. So appreciate them. Appreciate them for being patriots. And uh, with that being said, we got a lot to cover today. So do you want to introduce our guest? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So as you mentioned, this is the third part of our Shadows of Power series. Uh, and we are honored to have him in the studio with us, Cindy. Uh, Cindy is a victim advocate from Relentless Hope. Uh, she's from Utah, so she knows Utah pretty well, uh, being here herself. Uh, and she's going to tell us a little bit today about uh, her story, how she got started, and also the Glenn Pace memo, which some of you may have heard of. Uh, but we're going to dive into that today since that's really interesting. So, Cindy, nice to meet you. Welcome to the studio. And uh, where can they find you? Um, they can go to my website at relentlesshopeforyou.org. And is that spelled out, Relentless Hope 4, not the number 4? Okay. Correct. For Correct. you.org. Great. Well, let's get started. Um, what do you have for us today? Well, I want to educate your audience on what ritual abuse is and what happens and how it's run um, in the state of Utah. So I got my start uh, five years ago. I started working for an agency that helped polygamists escape. And from that, I've heard, I heard for, uh, horrific stories of ritual abuse. I'm a researcher at heart, and I started doing research on ritual abuse, everything I could find out there on the internet. One of the first things the survivors told me to do is look into the Glenn Pace memo. So I did, and I found it, and I read through it. Glenn Pace was a general authority um, in the latter Day Saints Church uh, from 1985 until his death in 2017. And so back in 1990, there were many, many reports of ritual abuse in the church. And so he was given the um, orders basically to investigate into it. And so he started by interviewing 60 survivors of ritual abuse. They all claim to be members of the LDS church. They all claim that their abuse happened either on church property or by members in the church, including leaders in the church. And what he, he came to the conclusion after speaking to each one of them uh, and what they were telling him that uh, he believed them. He said, there's no doubt this is happening. Can we pull up the memo? Okay. <clears throat> Here it is. Pursuant to the committee's request, I'm writing this memorandum to pass along what I learned about ritualistic child abuse. Hopefully it will be some value to you as you continue to monitor the problem. You have already received the LDS Social Services Report on Satanism dated May 24th, 1989, going back to the satanic panic of the 80s. A report from Brent Ward and a memorandum from myself, myself meaning Glenn Pace. Yes. Yes dated October 20th, 1989, in response to Brothers Ward's report. Therefore, I will limit this writing to information not contained in those papers. I have met with 60 victims. That number could be twice or three times as many if I did not discipline myself to only one meeting per week. 
I have not wanted my involvement with this issue to become a handicap in fulfilling my assigned responsibilities. On the other hand, I felt someone needed to pay the price to obtain an intellectual and spiritual conviction as to the seriousness of this problem within the church. Of the 60 victims with whom I've met, 53 are female and seven are male. Eight are children. The ab abuse recurred in the following places, 37 in Idaho, or 37 in Utah, three in Idaho, four in California, two in Mexico, and 14 in other places. 53 victims are currently living in the state of Utah. All 60 individuals are members of the church. 45 victims allege witnessing and or participating in human sacrifice. The majority was abused by relatives, often their parents. All have developed psychological problems and most have been diagnosed as having multiple personality disorder or some other form of dissociative disorder. Ritualistic child abuse is the most heinous of child abuse. The basic objective is to be premeditated to systematically and methodically torture and terrorize children until they are forced to dissociate. The torture is not a consequence of the loss of temper, but the execution of a well-planned, well-thought-out ritual often performed by close relatives. The only escape for the children is to dissociate. They will develop a new personality to enable them to endure various forms of abuse. When the episode is over, the core personality is again to control and the individual is not conscious of what has happened. Disassociation has, al has also served the purposes of the occult because the children have no day-to-day -day memory of the atrocities. They go through the adolescence and early adulthood with no active memory of what is taking place. Oftentimes, they continue in rituals through their teens and early 20s, unaware of their involvement. Many individuals with whom I've spoken have served missions and has not been until later they begin to remember. One individual's memories of participating in rituals while serving as a full-time missionary. Wow. The victims led relatively normal lives, but the memories are locked up in a compartment in their minds and surface in various ways. They don't know how to cope with the emotions because they can't find the source. As they become adults and move into another environment, something triggers the memories and, consequently, flashbacks and or nightmares occur. One day they will ha have been living a normal life and the next they will be in a mental hospital in a fetal position. The memories of their childhood are recalled in so much detail that they once again feel the pain that caused the dissociation in the first place. There are two reasons why adults can remember with such detail events that happened in their past. First, the terror they experienced was so stark that it was indelibly placed in their mind. Second, the memory was compartmentalized in a certain portion of their mind and was not subjected to the dilution of experiences of ensuing years. When it is tapped, it is as fresh as if it happened yesterday. The memories seem to come in layers. For example, the first memory might be of incest. Then they remember robes and candles. Next, they realize that their father or mother or both were present when they were being abused. Another layer will be the memory of seeing other people hurt and even killed. Then they remember having seen babies killed. Another layer is realizing that they participated in the sacrifices. One of the most painful memories may be that they even sacrificed their own baby. With each layer of memory comes another set of problems with which they must deal. Some have said that the witnesses to this type of treatment cannot be trusted because of the victim's unstable condition and because Practically all of them have some kind of dissociative disorder. In fact, the stories are so bizarre as to raise serious credibility questions. The irony is that one of the objectives of the occult is to create multiple personalities within the children in order to keep the, the secrets. They live in society without society having any idea that something is wrong with, with them since children and te teenagers don't even realize there's another life occurring in darkness and in secret. However, when 60 witnesses testify to the same type of torture and murder, it becomes impossible for me, personally, not to believe them. I mention multi multiple personalities because the spiritual healing which must take place in the lives of these victims cannot happen without the priesthood leaders understanding something about it. The spiritual indoctrination which takes place during the physical abuse is one of the most difficult to overcome. In addition to experiencing stark terror and pain, the children are also instructed in satanic doctrine. 
everything is completely reversed. White is black, black is white, good is bad, bad is good. Satan is going to rule during the millennium. Children are put in situations where they believe they are going to die, such as being buried alive or being placed in a plastic bag and immersed in water. Prior to doing so, the abuser tells the children to pray to Jesus to see if he will save him or her. Imagine a seven-year-old girl having been told she's going to die, praying to Jesus to save her, and nothing happens. And then at the last moment, she's rescued. But the person saving her is a representative of Satan. He uses this experience to convince her that the only person who really cares about her is Satan. She is Satan's child, and she might as well become loyal to him. Just before or shortly after the baptism into the church, children are baptized by blood into the satanic order, which is meant to cancel out their baptism into the church. They will be asked if they understand or have ever felt the Holy Ghost. When they reply that they have, they will be reminded of the horrible things that have participated in and will be told that they have become a son or daughter of perdition and therefore have no chance of being saved or loved by our Father in heaven or Jesus. All of the indoctrination takes place with whichever personality has emerged to endure the physical, mental, and spiritual pain. Consequently, there develops within each of these individuals the makings of what I call a civil war. As the memories begin to surface, there are personalities who feel they've given themselves to Satan and there's no hope for forgiveness. The core person is an active member of the church, often with a temp temple recommend. As integration takes place, the civil war begins. Sometimes in an interview, personalities of the dark side have come out. They, have, they are petrified or perhaps full of hate for me and what I represent. Eventually, those personalities need to be dealt with spiritually and psychologically. Most victims are suicidal. They have been brainwashed with drugs, hypno hypnosis, and other means to become suicidal as soon as they start to tell the secrets. They have been threatened all of their lives that if they don't do what they are told, their brother or sister will die, their parents will die, their house will be burned, or they themselves will be killed. They have every reason to believe it since they have seen people killed. They believe they might as well kill themselves instead of wait for the occult to do it. Some personalities feel it is the right thing to do. The purpose of this detail is to stress the complexity of psychological and spiritual therapy for these individuals. Our priesthood leaders, when faced with such cases, are understandably at a loss of how to respond. Orthodox counsel is completely ineffective. For example, some victims have been told that this has all happened in their past and that they should put it behind them and get on with their lives, but this is not possible. Part of the spiritual therapy necessary is for priesthood leaders to assist with the conversion process of the personalities who have been indoctrinated into Satanism. Victims must integrate their personalities so that they can function as a whole person and be able to deal with their problems and then get on with their lives. Often, some parts will begin to act out, perhaps promiscuously, and a good-intentioned priesthood leader following the general handbook of instructions will disfellowship or excommunicate an individual. All of this does is reinforce the satanic indoctrination of the victims that they are no good. I'm sorry to say that many victims have had their first fl flashbacks while attending the temple for the first time. The occult along the Wasatch Front uses the doctrine of the church to their advantage. For example, the verbiage and gestures are used in ritualistic ceremony in a very debased and often bloody manner. When the victim goes to the temple and hears the exact words, horrible mem memories are triggered. We have recently been disturbed with members of the church who have talked about the temple ceremony. Compared to what is happening in the occult along the Wasatch Front, these are very minor infractions. The perpetrators are also living a dual life. Many are temple recommend holders. This leads to another reason why the church needs to reconsider the seriousness of these problems. In effect, the church is being used. I go out of my way to not let the victims give the names of the perpetrators. I've told them that my responsibility is to help them with the spiritual healing and that the names of the perpetrators should be given to therapists and law enforcement. However, they have told me that the position in the church of members who are perpetrators, among them there are young women's leaders, young men leaders, bishops, a patriarch, a stake president, temple workers, and members of the tabernacle choir. These accusations are not coming from individuals who think they recognize someone, but from those who have been abused by people they know, in many cases their own family members. Whatever the form of abuse, our main concern is for the victims, but there are legal ramifications. We are disturbed to receive the reports 
that a scoutmaster has abused the boys and his troop. It is not difficult to imagine what would happen if we learn that the bishop or stake president has participated in the abominations of a ritualistic child abuse. Not only do some of the perpetrators represent a cross-section of the Mormon culture, but sometimes the abuse has taken place in our own meeting houses. I don't pretend to know how prevalent the problem is. All I know is that I've met with 60 victims. Assuming each one comes from a coven of 13, we're talking about the involvement of 800 or so right here on the Wasatch Front. Obviously, I've only seen those coming forth to get help. They're in their 20s and 30s for the most part. I can only assume that it is expanding geometrically, and I am horrified for the numbers represented by the generation who are now children and teenagers. And this is 1989, right? Yeah. Another reason for concern is that there are several doctrin doctrinal issues that need to be resolved. The church and society in general are very skeptical as to whether the occult and its activities do exist. There is no president first presidency statement relative to some of the doctrinal issues. What does a priesthood leader tell individuals who come forth and say that they have participated in these rituals, which may include human sacrifice? Should they have a temple recommend? Will they ever be forgiven? These are questions regarding free agency and accountability. Is there a person who has been raised in an occult from infancy accountable for these things that take place in a dissociated state, even though those acts were committed after the age of eight? I have formed my own opinions to these questions and have done the best I can. However, I don't have the mantle to make the doctrinal and policy decisions. I've relied on the mantle of a bishop regarding discernment and being a common judge. The few priesthood leaders who have had to face the issues are crying out for help because they don't want to give their own opinions. And yet there is no place to go for an answer. A bishop will go to his stake president who says he doesn't believe it is happening and that the member is just crazy. The stake president might go to an area presidency who will react in a similar way. Most people are afraid to surface to the first presidency for fear of getting the same reaction and don't want to appear crazy themselves for asking the question. <clears throat> you know, it's it's hard. Thank you for reading that, Alexia. Um, it's hard. Obviously, we've we've done three. Sh this is the third show we've done, and we talked to a lot of people. About this it's it's hard for me to talk to people about the ritualistic abuse because it sounds so crazy. I don't like even talking about it because I don't want people to think I'm crazy. I just tell them, hey, you should watch that show. I rarely will even tell them about what's in it because it's so f it's so it does seem so far out there. Um. You know, this was in 89. My question is, how many kids have been abused since then? And, and let's talk about this. So he was a general authority, um, someone who I think most people here in Utah would trust, someone I would trust. He clearly interviewed 60 people. That was a very extensive report. It's clearly happening, he said, at almost every level of the church, including the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. What happened after this came out? Well, the Utah legislation... Um, decided to do a deeper investigation, and so they funded an investigation for $250,000, and the investigation went on for about two and a half years. But eventually, they claimed there was no evidence, so nothing could be done, and then I was told that Governor Mike Levitt at the time shut down the case. Okay, so that's important under, to hear. Um, by now, there's the video may have come out about Mike Levitt. If it hasn't come out at this at this point, it will come out after this. You need to understand who Mike Levitt is, and if you and if you've not seen the video, or if it has not been released, it will be released right after this. If it's not already come, if it's already come out, go check and and watch the video on Mike Levitt. It will blow your mind. You need to know who he is. He is easily e easily one of the most corrupt people in the state of Utah. And also worth noting from Shadows and Powder Part Two. David Levitt, <clears throat> the old Utah County District Attorney, is his brother. Who was involved with ritualistic abuse. So Mike Levitt, and again, in the same family of David Levitt, and again, this is typically something f that goes on from one family, you know, from, fa from, from generationally. Um, but Mike Levitt, if you do not know who Mike Levitt is, you have to know who he is. Because if you understand, want to understand where the, where the real kingpin of the corruption in this state is, and I would say be the country he is at the very top of that list. And it's All also right. probably worth prefacing this like we did the first two shows. We're not speculating. We're not judge and jury. We're simply presenting the facts as been presented by court documents, 
official memos from the church. This is not our opinion, and this is not on us to. Yeah, and I also want to say, you know, this is why we we've been. I don't know if this this is why we've been taken off, hacked into YouTube, or if it's talking about Cox or or Sean Ray's or who it is. But you know, this is stuff that these people do not want this information getting out. They clearly tried to shut it down in the '80s. They led to the satanic panic, which that you know, an excuse to just like they did with the Red Scare to stop to allow communism to spread without people being able to call it out. This stuff's been going on. If you haven't watched the first show of, of uh, Shadows of Power and the second show, please watch those so you can understand. Um, and, and let's go on. Tell me, let's, what, what else do you want to talk about here? Well, after I read this memo, um, I decided to go out and do some research myself. Uh, I also have interviewed 60 survivors because I wanted to keep in line with Glenn Pace. And so for the past five years, that's what I've been doing. Um, we interview the survivors. They tell us their stories. Uh, the only thing different is that we do obtain names. We obtain uh, locations of where these uh, rituals have. We, we have a calendar. They have a calendar they use. So we know the when, where, how, why, and who's all involved. I have a perpetrator list of over 200 names. Um, the other interesting thing I looked into are statistics within the state. I wanted to know if there was anything that could kind of prove that this was going on. So I started to read different sources. Uh, For instance, Utah had the highest, ninth highest age adjusted suicide rate in the U.S. in 2020 for teens and an overall 66 percent higher suicide rate than the rest of the country. Wow. So I thought that was pretty incredible. Our tiny little state of 3 million people beat out larger states that had triple the size. Yeah. So that's telling me a lot. Um, the second thing is antidepressant drugs are prescribed in Utah more than any other state at a rate nearly twice the national average. Wow. Um, the biggest consumer of online pornography was Utah in a study conducted by Harvard University in 2009. And then in 2016, Governor, uh, Governor Herbert declared pornography a health crisis. Additionally, there is a report published by the University of Utah that ranked uh, Utah last in adult mental health measures in 2018. Each state was ranked, including the territories. Utah came in at number 51. So we're dead last. We have the highest level of mental health issues, but not enough resources to handle those. And Utah is the 16th wealthiest state in the nation. So there is just really no excuse why. And I will speculate it's done on purpose. Perps don't want survivors to get well because they start talking. And that's exactly what has happened with the survivors that I've been working with. Um, Government uh, statistical reporting on sex trafficking are grossly underestimated, and that's because they don't take into consider all these kids that are being ritually abused at homes and businesses, and their parents are part of it. So there's not going to be any reporting going on. Um, I estimate there are tens of thousands of victims in the state of Utah. Well, one of the interesting things too, in the Glenn Pace memo, is he said <clears throat> that uh, he's, he's recommending that it be, this stuff be handed to law enforcement. And what we learned from the Hamblin case is the law enforcement and the justice system in, in Utah is part of this. And therefore, when they're handing these people over, they're handling them right over to their handlers. So of course, no, no justice is coming. And then when you go to the top, the governor, and he's allegedly a part of this and protecting it all and calling it all a satanic panic and that these the kids are all crazy and dismissing all these abused people no wonder so i'm, I'm wondering we're talking about the victims right now and maybe you'll get into the perpetrators a little bit more with the mental health crisis i mean that explains a majority of of the victims that might be here i mean obviously there could be a myriad of issues outside of ritualistic abuse are there any identifying markers for the perpetrators uh, when after the the show came out, we actually met with someone who I who I will not name his name uh, because it is speculation, and I know he was either friends with someone we called out in Provo, and we specifically said, you know, this guy's running for a council position in in, in Provo, 
and he would not make eye contact he, with us. And I, 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 he looked and he looked me in the eye, and, he, and it was like he knew I knew he was yeah. one of them. So and our, it was he got so uncomfortable. So we it were just bringing so this up to be like, yeah. hey, you know, if if there's something going on in Provo, what's what's raise the alarm and and make it known to the people outside of the people that have seen this show and other related shows. And outside of that interaction where it was very, both Jason and I walked away from that and we said, that guy's red flag for being a perpetrator. And that's putting it nicely. Are there any th indicators? Because even with a lot of the shows where we've named names before, we've gotten the feedback. Oh, that person was so nice. You know, they were my whatever teacher or counselor or bishop or priesthood leader. What are the indicators, if any, for the perpetrators? That's the interesting part because uh, they look like everyday people. Right. They're not the thugs that you see on the news that they, you know, did a burning down cover. cities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's it's white men and women. Mm -hmm. They look like they sit in the church pews every week because most of them do. They're the nicest people. I've I've heard that a lot. Oh, they can never be a part of this. They're so nice. Right. But you don't, like, look at Roselle Anderson, who was Hamlin. Have you seen a latest picture of her? She looks angelic, and nobody would ever know, but yet she was uh, arrested for child rape, uh, abuse. The, the, the list goes on. I mean, they master the art of, of, of deceit. Well, it goes back to what the Glenn Pace memo said, the disassociative personality. They might, in, in truth... They might not actually know. I feel like someone at that well, level probably knows that she's doing evil things. But I think that they have their, these these personalities. When they're, when they're in their church personality, they are probably very legitimately in that spirit, in that personality. And then when they flip, it is probably like literally a different person. I imagine it's got to be something. Oh, like yeah. That. Yeah, I've, I've interviewed perpetrators, and they are so nice until you start mentioning Oh, where were you at this particular time? Uh, do you know this particular once you, trigger, once you once trigger, you trigger, once you trigger the other them? self, yes, they switch. On and it's a own. different person. It is. There's and that's how that's how they do it. It, it literally is a different person. Yeah, yeah. This, and that's and that's how they're trained through, through the abuse is to do, is to do that. So yes. what is this? So this is what I was talking about uh, Utah being dead last as far as mental health okay. um, access. Okay. Um, so, and this uh, is huge, you know, and that's what I love. Where are you going with this? Go ahead. So a lot of people ask me who's all involved in this. So I can, uh, say that without a doubt, it, politicians are involved, celebrities are involved, uh, world leaders are involved, um, CEO, CEOs, a company, the police are involved because the police come and watch keep watch over the ritual, making sure nobody comes into the building where they're not allowed. And as their tip, um, they get to rape the children after the rituals. And, and of course, I'm not talking about all police, right? There are very good men and women in blue, and I But some I are placed. But some are strategically some, placed. Absolutely, absolutely. And I love that you brought Marina Abramovic in because, it, and for our listeners, if, if this stuff is new to you, I would highly recommend do a search um, for Marina Abramovic and do a search for spirit cooking. Uh, this stuff is out in the open. Uh, Hollywood celebrities, you can see them in you know, the photo here. They do these, you know, in, in, in public uh, mock human sacrifices where they eat the flesh of people. Of course, in the public, it's cake or it's, it's fake. But they do this stuff with, with, with spirit cooking with, with semen and, and milk from a, a woman's breast and, and what, I don't know, whatever else, sick stuff. And they paint with and blood. Uh, they're, they're out in the open what they're doing. And, and here's what's wild. Uh, and if you look right here on the screen, uh, President Zelensky recently appointed her to be an ambassador for Ukraine. And if you saw the second uh, Shadows of Power, the connection between, allegedly there is a connection between David Levitt and... Um, Marina. Uh, Marie, uh, Marina, but also... Um, Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So this is all one. These guys, it, it, it appears that they definitely, there's connection here. 
And what's even more interesting, she's not just an ambassador for Ukraine. She's overseeing the schooling for yes. the youth. Yes, correct. So, so it's specifically working with the children. In and again, all, all you do is look at Hollywood. Look at the UN. Look at this, the satanic statues. This stuff is real. What we just they, saw They are getting Iowa. bold. They are getting very bold. And, and, and so to, to have your head in the sand and say this stuff doesn't happen is, is honestly, it's, it's ignorant. Yeah. It's, it's ignorant and naive to say this stuff is not going on when it is literally in your face and they're not even hiding it anymore. And literally you have general, general authorities talking about it. So this stuff is happening. We can put our head in the sand or we can, or we can face it, and, and especially when it is right in front of us, and we start dealing with it. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to take you through what a ritual, how it works. Um, so usually what happens, 85% uh, of my clients, their parents were their handlers. Their parents bring them to buildings, um, meeting houses, temples, government buildings, uh, public buildings. Uh, they drop them off. The child is taken into a, a room where they are then disrobed. Some of them are put in cages and some of them are chained up. Uh, they bring out each child, usually individually, into a ceremony room. That's usually in a basement. Okay. Like the basement of the, one of the Edgemont wards, isn't that uh, one where there's been, where we have record of that stuff happening? Correct, correct. If, if, I mean, this, if, is, this is U Provo, Utah, Edgemont ward. Oh. I'm sorry, we're calling out. It's, <laughs> it's Salt Lake County. Salt Lake or, County. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And so um, they take them to the basement, and usually there's a group of men um, and women in robes. The robes, uh, the color of the robes they use uh, depend on the holiday that they're celebrating. So they're going to definitely celebrate um, regular holidays like Christmas, Easter, but they also celebrate um, prophet birth dates and death dates. Hmm. They also celebrate during solstices. Um, Which is today. Yes, today. There's a big <laughs> ritual abuse today. And so if you're a praying person, get on your knees and pray for these kids because it's, it's going to be a bloodbath. I feel the heaviness today. Yeah. yeah. I feel it. It's in the air. So um, once they're brought into the room, uh, they're put in an altar in the center of the ring of these yeah, men. I think you had a photo of that, didn't you? Um, what was the photo? There we go. So, I mean, this th these photos are from a movie called Eyes Wide Shut, uh, 1997, Nicole Kidman and Tom Cruise. This is what it looks like. It's a, a ring of people in usually black robes. They're always wearing masks. Always. Um, okay, let's see this. So the child's laid down on the altar. They're usually drugged at this point because they want to keep them complicit, quiet. Uh, they will start torturing the child. They will gain rape the child, um, sodomize the child. Um, and there's no age limit for this. This could be as early as birth. Well, they do start them out at birth. So this includes babies being sodomized. Uh, there's a reason for that, and I'll explain it. But um, they usually use them between birth and 18 years of age. By the time they're adults, um, they can continue in the ritual abuse, but most of them leave at that point because they're adults and they can leave. Um, so, yeah, they, they put them through horrific ceremonies. There's the Eve ceremony. Uh, there is baptism to Satan that's going on. Uh, there's marriage to Satan going on. Um, there's resurrection ceremonies. And this is, in the resurrection ceremonies, there's different types. But one of them is they have stock tanks full of blood. And sometimes they'll put a dead person floating in there. They'll put the child into it and drown them. Uh, the child effectively has an, an experience where they come out of their body at this point. And they watch themselves and what's going on. Now, I'm not going to get into the scientific part of that, but there's always doctors or nurses and even dentists or veterans that are part of these rituals. Uh, they're the ones that know exactly when to bring the child back, resuscitate the child. And so uh, they will essentially, while the child is dead, they, they believe in spirit jumping. 
And so the ritual abuse uh, people that are performing this are asking former prophets uh, to come into this child's body. And then they will revive them and they will bring them up out of the blood. And, and many times there'll be a mess. They don't want any evidence, right? Because this is in a church. Uh, these are in government buildings, so they will take the child back and wash them inside and out, so there's absolutely no evidence. You can't take a child to forensic exams because they've cleaned them out. They put their clothes back on, they send them back home. A typical ritual can last all night, but it can be done in as little as three hours. Um, and no one's the wiser because they're home in bed by 5.30 in the morning and they can get up and go to school. Uh, they can perform whatever task uh, that's assigned to them. So that's essentially what happens during a ritual. Can, can I ask you a personal question? Yes. I understand you're a victim advocate. Correct. Are you also a survivor? I am not a ritual abuse survivor, no. Okay. But I understand narcissists and psychopaths because I was raised by one. And that's what all of these people are. They are narcissists and psychopaths. They have seared their conscience. That's, I mean, that's really the only way that you can do it. Now, the children themselves are forced during these rituals to do things to other children. Some of them are forced to rape other children. Some of them are forced to rape their own siblings. Um, they're also forced to participate. As they get older, these, these men and women typically like the children between zero and eight years old. Uh, but once they hit puberty, they're not as interested in them. So they will retrain the survivor to perform a, a specific task during the ritual. Sometimes these uh, survivors will be in the back to clean the children, dress the children. Uh, they, the survivor, the older survivors will bring the children into the ceremonial room. So, and, and then they stay afterwards to clean. So there's always a cleaning crew. You know, it's interesting. Something we didn't touch during the David Lebbett episode is uh, he was, anyway, I think the Fox News, Adam Herberts actually explored this. He had a handyman that kept getting arrested over and over and over and kept, of course, walking away clean. I'm, I'd be curious if that handyman was taking care of some of this dirty work. I'm sure they had people employed in every facet of, of the ceremony, post-ceremony, pre-ceremony to set this up. But it, you said something interesting, the zero through eight, and I, I feel that's significant because what we know about through psych psychology is that's when the child's brain is forming. Mm -hmm. That's the most formidable ages for a child. So you think that that eight is significant uh, because of that reason, or is there another more spiritual reason they go till eight? Um, they're easier to program. So all these survivors go through, some people don't like me using this name, I'm gonna say it anyway, MK Ultra programming, monarch programming um, from the time of birth until eight. Well, it goes on before that, but from zero to eight is the primary age you want children to be going through programming because their minds are so, you know. Uh, oh, they're in their subconscious. They're easy yeah, to mold. They're easy to mold. They're That's the word I was looking age. for. Thank you. Moldable. You're, they're, that is when their hard wire is being set. Yes. Uh, prior, and, and even better than that, mm. if you get, get the child between the ages of birth to three, that's even better. Right. So that's why they start them out as babies right away. So, uh, one of the things they use uh, is sodomy. Uh, so, and the reason they do sodomy is they want to take the innocence from the child. And in replace of, or in place of uh, sodomizing a child, the perpetrator gets benefits. By worshiping Satan, you get uh, money, power, position. So that's why these people are doing this. They're, they're definitely doing it for benefits. And uh, when you sodomize a child, people don't understand this either from a, a medical perspective. The colon in the rectum is innervated with nerves that go straight into the spine, obviously, and goes all the way up to the brain. Is this the diagram you had on the next slide? So um, 
actually, yeah, this is, this is an example of what they call floppy colon. So we took in uh, one of our survivors to get a full scope um, forensics exam. And they discovered that, and this, this survivor was older. She was in her 50s, and she had been ritually abused all her, most of her younger adult life. And even after 20 years, they could see the evidence of floppy colon. And so as you can see, the normal colon is on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side is what happens when a child is sodomized deep with large objects. And as you can imagine, that would be excruciating when the person has a bowel movement. Isn't that the way, was it Heather O'Rourke back in the 80s? I think she passed away. It was very mysterious, the poltergeist child actor. Oh, yeah, yeah. She, she passed away from something like a, a descended colon or, or something to that effect. So it wouldn't surprise me if it was tied to this type of ritualistic abuse. Yeah, absolutely. What, what happened to uh, Pace? Quinn Pace. Pace after after this came out and after uh, he was basically silenced by Mike Levitt. Well, my understanding uh, may be flawed, but I heard that he was kind of shunned. He was uh, shipped off to do a mission in South America to kind of keep him quiet, essentially, make sure he stays in line. He died right before he died in 2017. A survivor went to go visit him, and he validated everything he said. He goes, I still stand by it. I still s support survivors. This, this really is truly happening. He died three days later after that visit. He was so distraught um, with tears in his eyes. He was like, yeah. What was the cause of death? Was it suspicious at all? No, I don't no, think so. just old age. Yeah. Well, I guess they feel somewhat protected if he put out a memo like that and nothing happened. Oh. I mean, the governor. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. That is satanic panic. There's nothing there but a bunch of crazy people. Crazy people. That's right. They used like the us. Yeah, they use the media to silence it. I mean, it. When, you get, when you own the media, yes. in Vision Utah, when you own the media and you get the media to push it out there and the, all the voices say it's, it's a bunch of crazies and, yeah. and it's satanic panic and it's, you know, and it's, it's just like what they do with the Red Scare. That's how communism has taken over this country because when they first started doing it, people called it out. The media said, oh, it's these people are crazy. They're just calling everybody a communist. It's just the Red Scare. They did the exact same thing here, and it allowed communism to take hold in this state country, and literally we're now watching it being taken over, and it's allowed this satanic ritual abuse to completely get who knows how deep it is now. Yeah, um, about 36%. Uh, this was a stat. Uh, and I can't remember the source of it, but 36% of people who go through the ritual abuse become perpetrators themselves. So exponentially, each decade this goes by, there are more and more and more of them. Well, if you use that math, and he was saying this in 1989, there's now thousands just in this state alone on oh, the Wasatch Front. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Just of the known. That's insane. Incredible. Yeah. After there are first few episodes of this, I can't even go to a crowded, you know, grocery store or meeting hall anymore without wondering how many people in there might be Satanists. Yeah, it's hard to believe. Like honestly, it's really is hard to believe it. And that's why this I think that's why darkness has so much power in this world. Because I think we just don't want to believe it. And it's and, and rightfully so. Like, how can that be? Like it just yeah. it just seems hard to believe this type of evil could exist. And I think it's so evil and so dark, that's how they get away with it, is it's just it's almost like unbelievable. It literally is unbelievable. So many of my survivors. But I think that oh, also, you know, is, is in another show we want to talk about is is part of the, U the Utah way, is that you know because again we have close friends and, and family that are law enforcement, and what we hear goes on in Salt Lake City and in Utah County is insane, the amount of crime, murders, but the media won't touch it. It's protected. Like they w we really try to protect the image of Utah as this family friendly. Nothing, nothing. All is well in Zion. It's very safe. There's nothing, no crime here. Meanwhile, you have real crime going on, and you have this, this, the deepest, gross, te most grotesque, evil imaginable stirring underneath the covers. But, but we like to keep things covered, and so that people don't look down there. Happy and, I, and, and that's and that's one of the frustrations I hear from these police officers is what is really going on versus what the public sees is two very different stories. 
Well, I can tell you one mine shaft you might want to check out. It's Eureka Mountain. The mine shaft there, 2,500 feet deep. One of my survivors said that there are bodies down there because she saw them being thrown down there. So if anybody wants to check that out, that would be great. Well, and that's one reason I like this awareness, because these guys are operating out there. And, I, and, and you know, to our listeners and viewers is, you know, if enough people are, are, start looking and videoing and, and this stuff, there's DNA out there. Like this stuff should not be able to be un, uh, going to wraps. And it's gone into wraps because the media has kept it in wraps. And that's our mission is to get people to start looking and to get police officers to start looking because if people start digging, you're going to find you're going to find this. Oh, you're going to find evidence. Absolutely. So, like I said, in these rituals, they have cleaners that come in and clean up. I mean, but DNA it, is still there. Correct. Can't get rid of DNA. Correct. And and, and, and if people start, you know, again, that's why this needs to gather. People need to start going and looking. Yes. So let me ask you a question. Um, it, you know, it's it's great to have Goel talk about this stuff. I love hearing the victim statements, and I appreciate you coming on. Well, I don't love hearing the victim statements. But. No, no, but I, but I appreciate the validity of, of them. Um, one of the things I had a hard time with, you know, in our last interview with, with Goel is, is when he would say, well, I heard this, and I heard these people are involved, and I heard these people are involved. And I'm not interested in what you heard. I would be interested in, in hearing from the survivors. I would like to hear, and honestly, I would love to have the survivors with a lie detector test. I would love to, I would, because here's the thing, if this stuff's going on, it needs to be, we need, we need people to come forward and we need, and we need to establish the credibility of it and go after people and, and demand accountability. Um, what would it take to get some of these women to come on the show? Well, I already have two that are willing to come on the show and speak about their, uh, uh, okay. They're credible, they're articulate, they're intelligent. One of them's studying to be a lawyer right now. She's in her third year of law school. So, um, very believable. Okay, I'd love to do that. Yes. We'll, we'll make that another show. Well, and if they shut us down before then, we'll, no, we we'll just keep going. We'll, we'll keep, we'll find, we'll <laughs> just go to our website. We'll open new channels. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we ain't stopping. And if, we, if okay. they do, we'll know that maybe it's these people behind it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, truth has a way of, of, make, of rising to the surface. Um, so, okay, so before, before I know we're wrapping up here, what, what other thoughts do you have that you want our audience to know about, um, about the victims, about what's going on? What, what else should they know? Well, um, I, want, I want to educate your audience on what happens to the survivors. Um, there are some consequences to what's going on here. There's mental, obviously, physical abuse. So a survivor who's going through this is definitely going to have dissociative identity disorder. They're fractured during the rituals. And so those different uh, parts are then trained for certain tasks. Uh, some of them are, some of those parts are uh, considered reporter parts where they will go out and talk to people about what happened to them and then they're obligated to come back to their handler and said, say what they spoke about. Um, Glenn Pace was right. They are programmed to commit suicide if they talk. So that's why you don't hear from a lot of survivors coming out and telling you this. They're terrified. And the fact that there's been no justice. Like, if, if I had been a victim. Like a Hamlin daughter? If, if I was a victim and I saw what happened to Hamlin daughters and the people who did come forth and, you know, the Glenn Pace memo and the fact that there's all the risk is on me. If I come forward, all the risk is on me that I'll be off or something will happen to my family. Or, and what is the, what hope do I have for, for, uh, for justice when everyone who's come forward so far has been silenced? Why would I come forward? Why would I put that risk on myself when I know the justice system has been taken over? Absolutely, absolutely. They can't even trust the police. Yeah, which is which is why this stuff has to get out. Yeah, yeah. Um, my survivors have gone to try to file a police report and have been turned away. They've been ridiculed in the police station. They've been told you're crazy. You dreamt this up. This didn't happen. Um, and they've been sent away without their report. They deserve a report because if they get a police report. 
they can at least go and get crime repar reparations be, uh, from VOCA, which is Victims of Crime Act. It's set aside money to help these survivors get counseling, medical care, the things they need. And if you're denied a police report, guess what? You can't get help that you need. So we, we uh, oh, I could go on and on. There are other ways that they punish survivors. Well, it might be a blessing, though. I mean, if the system is so captured, if they were sent to a medical professional, who knows that they aren't part of it themselves. So it You're makes exactly you, right. It makes you cynical. Cindy, exactly what is, right. you know, you've been doing this for how many years now? Five years. What's been the hardest thing for you about doing this? Oh, gosh. When I first started this, I went into a deep depression. Because I was listening to this stuff all the time, and I was feeling it. I'm an empath. And so I went down into that dark hole with them to get the information I'm getting. And it just about took me out. I, I had to take a break for a while. And anybody who decides, oh, I want to do this, I want to get into this, you better check with God first. Because God will grace you to handle this. If he doesn't, this could destroy you so be very careful um do research before you start diving into this um that's why i love the hamblin case is, is you have the the, the um, victim statements and 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 multiple statements to collaborate and you have you know obviously what we know about gordon bowen and his whole life and everything everything pulls together this is where i think what needs we need a little bit more meet to kind of because that's where i have our time is okay we we it's because it feels like and again i don't want to be dismissive if people who have been abused because clearly this is happening but what we really need is something to substantiate it so that i can feel safe talking about it you know and and if this is happening so much there's got to be something more substantial in other words, that's why I want to have the girls. We need the, we Absolutely. need the people to come on and and talk about it. They they they've got to come forward. Yes. This stuff has to come out. They're just if we don't get justice now, we're not going to get justice. Yes. This is the time. The time to get justice is when we have access to the internet, to social media, when we can be of louder voice than the mainstream. And this is the time to that this stuff has to get out and exposed. Alexia, final thoughts? No, I just think uh, if you're intrigued by this or want to know more we'll continue to do these episodes and even if they take us down we'll keep going i think the next step is to get some of the victims on here so stay tuned for shadows of power part four where we can hopefully tie in some of the themes that we've talked about these last three episodes and and substantiate it more because once again we're not judge and jury we're not here to accuse we're leaving some of the facts on the table and some things that we just don't know what to make of it as we piece more of this together and and this huge web that's all tied into the victims and political leaders and CEOs and celebrities and, and potentially even church leaders. We're not here to implicate. We're here to give you the information so you can decide. Awesome. Thank you, baby. Uh, Cindy, thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, I don't envy you. I've, I've, I've looked enough into this stuff um, to have felt the darkness and been d disturbed deeply by this and, and disturbed enough to want to bring this darkness to light. Um, I can't imagine how it is talking face to face to some of these people who've been through it. And so God bless you for your strength and for standing up and fighting against something that I know must feel like you're shouting into, into emptiness because so much of society doesn't want to accept this. Um, and to our listeners and viewers, um, it's, this amazing time to be alive. I'm going to tell you something right now. The Utah establishment is fracturing um, the people are waking up. We're seeing through the corruption. We are, we are demanding accountability on the smart cities, on, on this, this, the World Economic Forums, on the globalist things happening here in Utah, this, the, the election fraud that's clearly happening throughout the state. Your elected, uh, elected officials, many of them are waking up and saying, we're not part of this. Um, and, then those, and then you've got warring factions right now happening. So it is, it is exciting to see this establishment of power in Utah that has had been so clearly in control for so long is, is becoming fractured. It, they are losing their grip, and that is why they're coming after and trying to censor us. It's why they went after Ben 
and McClintock, and that's why they'll continue to come after people who stand up and, and speak. But this is where we've got to hold our ground because we, I can tell you, they're, they, we are, they are, they, they, they know they're vulnerable and they're vulnerable because you keep sharing this content. So keep sharing this, keep talking to your neighbors and keep calling your reps, your, especially your state reps. Forget the federal reps, your state reps. It is about this, the USA, the, 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 DC is turning into an absolute circus. Get control of our backyard and our backyard happens to be one of the most important states in the country. And if we can stop it here, that's where well, that's we can stop it everywhere. So, anyways, there, there is something that yeah. stuck out to me in the Glenn Pace memo as I was reading it earlier in the episode. Uh, it was like something along the lines of "good is bad, bad is good, evil is good, everything's upside down," and that feels like what the times we're living in right now. And remember, when it feels that way, and it feels like truth is upside down and and pulled on its head, you know the truth. You know whether you need to pray for discernment or you have that actual knowledge yourself, know that this is part of the adversary's plan is to put truth on trial. But as long as we stay true to what we know and our faith, then we can know that truth is truth and truth will prevail in the end. I love it. So thank you guys for watching. Please make sure you're following Cindy. Make sure you're following all the great people we bring on here and make sure you're doing your job to spread to truth because this is all of our war. It's not ours. It's, it's all of ours. We're all in this fight together. So anyways, God bless you guys. God bless America and God bless Utah.